Hi, good evening and welcome to We Only Sing When We're Winning. This is our fifth podcast now, I believe. Um, we're still indoors, still doing it virtually, uh, but I'm delighted to be joined by three great friends. We've got a giant of the non-league um, world, but sadly not as much of a giant in stature. It's Charlie Marriott. I'm five foot six. There's nothing wrong with being five foot six. It's the no, camera no. angle. I look taller because of the camera angle. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 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 nothing against your height, mate. It's perfectly adequate, I'm sure. Um, we, we've also got a man who can only be described as the Rafa Mir to my Lewis Graben. It's Martin Gray. My camera <laughs> angle also makes me look like <laughs> <laughs> And last but not least, we've got the man who puts hard man in Gareth Hardman. Welcome to Gareth. I can't say anything else after that. That sums me up. Is it true that your hair is now longer than I am tall? Well, five foot six, yeah? Yeah. By next week. By next week. I expect to see this. Yeah. How it's not down today. It's not down. It, just for clarity, it's probably the hottest day of the year so far. I think it is, yeah. And I was having my hair down all day and you start sweating at the back of your neck. So that's not pretty. So it's up today. Okay. I, know, I know we've had fun today. <laughs> week. So, literally, I've had people viewing it just for my hair. So, sorry, guys. Yes, we've got a pretty busy uh, 45 minutes coming up. We're going to round up the last seven days of the footballing world. We're going to round up the last seven days on the blog. We're going to do our squad builders because um, I've set the lads a challenge over the past few days and we'll see what they've come up with. And finally, we'll do Martin's quiz. But firstly, Gareth, I need to ask, how are you? Because it's now... 25 years since Everton last won a trophy. Our silver jubilee of being silverwareless. Yes, it's a ra rather remarkable day. 25 years ago today, we beat um, Manchester United in the uh, 1995 FA Cup final. And we haven't won a trophy since. I was thinking about this, and it's actually quite a big milestone. But actually, there are a lot of clubs who have had longer droughts. Uh, City went 34 years. How long has it been since West Brom last won one? Too long. Yeah. Um, and I know that Chelsea had a, was it 30, 40 years stint without a trophy? So it's not great, but it could be worse. You're saying your time will come, basically. You've got to look at it that way. You've well, got to look the Europa at it that way. Conference League starting in a couple of years, so, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's the ideal trophy. That has Everton messing up the final against a non-league Belarusian side written all over it. It's interesting because you think like a cup like the Carabao Cup might be for Everton, yeah? We've never won it. We've won everything else in England, but we've never won the League Cup. Been to the final twice, but never won it. So, make of that what you will. So, with the roundup, I think there's only one place to start. The Bundesliga is back. And you Martin, <laughs> you've been watch Martin, you've been watching quite a bit of this. Why don't you tell us what you think? I've probably watched every game so far that I could possibly watch when games weren't going on at the same time. So I started off on Saturday uh, with a double header. Um, the first game was so remarkable, I've forgotten what it was. It was Dortmund Schalke. Schalke, yeah. Dortmund Schalke, 4 0. It was a 4 0. It, it was quite a boring game because it was just Dortmund, 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 you know. And then the second game was much more interesting Frankfurt against Bunchen Gladbach. I was completely torn. I, I sent a message to Charlie on, on Saturday afternoon saying, who do I support? I lived in Frankfurt for four months. Me and Charlie went to uh, Mönchengladbach just to watch a game because that's what we do, you know. Um, but it was a great game. Both sides looked pretty decent. Um, and it's good to see that actually this year Dortmund and Munich have some competition. In I, think, the I think with Gladbach, the significant thing was they scored after 35 seconds. Yeah. And it was a good goal as well. Mm. Really good goal. And I think was, the, the second went in after about six or seven minutes. It wasn't long, was it? it was brilliant. How, I haven't seen any of it. So how have the celebrations been after scoring a goal without any fans in the stadium? Uh, interesting. Hertha are in big trouble because they celebrated. One of their centre-backs ran the length of the pitch and came up and cuddled the goal scorer. So they're in quite trouble, I think. And that, it, I saw an article today that the Bundesliga clubs have been reminded that they have to obey social distancing. Yep, and, and, and of course this podcast um, condones following the social distancing regulations at all times. Um, but what about the Sunday? Because I thought 
Cologne v Mainz was probably the best match I've seen so far. It was an interesting game in that Mainz looked really proficient the whole match, but they somehow found themselves 2-0 down. I thought the BT commentators were absurd during this match because they kept talking for the whole match as though Cologne were dominant. And yes, they were 2-0 up, but I was looking at it thinking, this isn't the match I'm watching. Like, Mainz are playing some good stuff. And and they, they, they had a lovely goal to get themselves back into it. And Cologne flagged and in the end I mean the last 10 minutes were great because it's end-to-end -end stuff both sides going for the winner but in the end I thought it was Mainz that finished the stronger the hold on a minute Josh has disagreed with commentators this is new this is new I think he's right actually um Whoa, because that's and, even newer and this is this is more this is just as much for your benefit Gareth but I watched the highlights on BT Sports YouTube channel they put all the games up as like three four minute highlights which is quite good and yeah, no, no, Josh is right. They were going for Cologne the whole time. And then when Mainz equalised, it was, and Cologne have thrown this away. It was like, hang on a minute. Much closer than that. And you know what? Mainz's second goal was a cracker as well. Mm. You oh, the I, I, it was, that was Hildeberto Pereira-esque, that was. The guy walked through about three or four challenges before um, putting one past the keeper. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd, I had a question for... Well, probably just for Josh, if you guys haven't watched it, Charlie's watched the highlights. But who would you say was your kind of player to watch for the rest of the Bundesliga season? A, a player to watch for the Bundesliga season? Yeah, who do you um, think is kind of a, a big talent, up-and-coming talent, beyond the likes of Sancho and Haaland? And those if, um, to be honest, um, I'll answer that I, I won't pick one name. I want to pick three. I want to pick the Bayer Leverkusen front three because at the moment I don't think they are yet household names but watching them play I mean they look seriously good and I think that if Bayer can hold on to those three players for the next couple of years they're going to be very strong not only in the Bundesliga but in Europe as well they've got a front three all three players are aged 20 or under and they were fantastic Havertz in particular was yes, yeah. yes. He, uh, um, he he scored two goals, I think. But it was the guy on the right wing, uh, Musa Diaby. He was unplayable at times. And um, and then they had a seventeen-year-old. I think it was Wirtz, um yeah. on the left wing. I mean, I was astounded when they said he was seventeen. And the couple of lads they had coming off the bench to replace them uh, weren't bad either. So I mean. By Leverkusen the fifth, it's probably a bit late for them to mount a serious challenge to the title. But if they can keep that squad together, then they're going to be a force. Well, I don't know, Josh. You say that. I've got the table in front of me because of a point I wanted to make. But Leverkusen are only eight points off with, was it, 34 games in Germany. So eight points off with eight to go. It's you know what impossible. You is Dortmund against Munich. So if that's a draw, there's... Mm. Yeah, it opens the door, yeah. 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 The one I was going to pull out was just about not a player, but a team. But I thought Freiburg played really well against Leipzig. And, like, you know, they scored a last-minute winner that got ruled out. But if they had won that 2-1, you, you wouldn't have said that that was the, like, the worst result that could have happened. I thought Leipzig were absolutely dreadful. Leipzig did not do much at all. And, like, Freiburg deserved to go in front. They, you know, I think on balance, Leipzig probably deserved their equaliser. But for Freiburg to smash and grab a win at the end wouldn't have been... Outrageous. And, and yeah. it's going to be a really interesting end to the season because we've got these five teams going for the top four places and there's not an awful lot between them. I mean, as we were saying earlier, I was expecting there to be a real gulf between Bayern, Dortmund and the rest. And I don't think there was. How much of that is down to match fitness, do you reckon? Uh, Dortmund looked very on it. So... Mm. If I had to pick the team of the weekend, Dortmund would be the team. They looked mm -hmm. miles ahead of Munich. Um, Munich, they struggled in the first half against Union Berlin. Um, only got a penalty late on in the first half, which of course Lewandowski put away. No it was a was deserved off. penalty as well. Yeah, <laughs> the tackle yeah, was I, shocking. I, I, um, yes, yes Subotic um, had a bit of a freeze there. It was a pretty awful defending. But apart from that, I don't remember Bayern actually creating a, a serious opportunity. Yes, Muller had the goal ruled out for offside early on. But beyond that, I don't remember Bayern creating very much. So Bayern perhaps are off the pitch, but Dortmund looked right on it against Schalke. 
Because that's going to be a massive factor in deciding all of the remaining leagues, which play, which teams can get their players match fit again the quickest. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, uh, it will be. It's undoubtedly going to play a factor. And it's worth actually saying that we've been criticising Bayern Munich, but it's their first game back and they won. And if it is going to take them a few games to get back up to their best, if they're still winning, they're still picking up points, then, you know, if, if, if they can get a point or maybe even three against Dortmund uh, on next Tuesday, you've got to think they're in with a very good chance of the title. I think Bayern have won the last seven or eight, so they know you what want, they're doing. You want a new name, though, don't you, really? You don't want it to turn into Scotland. You do. You want Munch and Club back to Mount the yeah. Lake yeah, Absolutely. Not so... Much. I, this is a subject we haven't really discussed in the podcast so far, which is maybe a little bit sign of the times. Uh, I've heard VAR works better in Germany than it does in Britain. Is that true? Yes. Do you think? Really? Because Munich's goal, to me, it was so clear that Müller was offside and we were waiting for a good 90 seconds, two minutes, to actually get that decision that Müller was offside. It, it felt like they used it less and possibly that's a small sample size because I think I watched five games over the weekend. But from some of the Premier League games I've watched, it really can descend into fast when mm -hmm. you have sort of like, you're adding sort of 10 minutes on per game. You're having all these stupidly marginal offside decisions. Yeah. Whereas from the, from the games that I saw, they only did one or two VAR checks per match. And I can't remember the call that you mentioned, but generally I thought the decisions were pretty reasonable. Is it just that the standard of refereeing is better in Germany, perhaps? It might well be. It's a very simple answer to a complex question. It's, yeah. Um, I, don't know, I don't know whether just one weekend of games can really give us a definitive answer. It's something to watch again over the coming weeks and hopefully the powers that be in charge of the referees in this country are maybe looking at it and seeing where they can improve. Because technology's there, it's not going to go anywhere, we just need to be able to learn to use it better. Well, I think we just need to put more trust in referees again. We need the referees to trust to do that. We do, we do to be fair, but it is their job. Yeah. If you're checking the quality of everybody's job, you know, if I was, if I was at work and if every lecture that I gave, somebody came along to assess the quality of my job, I'm going to feel under pressure and my quality is probably going to be worse. Mm. So, you know, I, I, I do think referees are in a difficult position, particularly given this is the first season in the Premier League where yeah. AR has been used. Very good argument. Very well made. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, Gareth, I know you, because you wrote an article a couple of weeks ago about how, you know, the way you follow football has changed and how yeah. technology's developed and you can watch it more from afar. Do you think that you, know, you might want to be tempted to do this with the Bundesliga over the next few weeks? Absolutely. Um, I work every Saturday, so obviously that's one of the reasons why football's become so difficult to follow. But the Sunday matches are very interesting. I was looking into it, it probably wouldn't be worth me buying a BT Sports subscription. I wouldn't watch enough of it to make it value for money. But Charlie pointing out that the highlights are available on YouTube is a very, very good option. Can I, make it, yeah, can I just jump in with a point there? So obviously a lot of this isn't happening because there's no football on at the minute. But right now, as in today I've done this, I have watched highlights from Germany and South Korean football for free on YouTube. Um, when all the leagues are running as normal, uh, the English Spanish leagues are they have English commentary on their highlights uh, it's Italy as well uh, the French league has French commentary but again that doesn't really detract uh, Japan their leagues has free highlights um, MLS does but I don't know if it's geo blocked in this country because of the Sky Sports contract when I was in Japan MLS worked and then the um, the champion the USL championship in the states as well they've got free highlights, um, so a lot of it I think even Australia's got it as well. Um, so that like, the majority of the leagues in the world and and the Russian Premier League because I've just remembered that as well. So like the vast majority of the top leagues in the world will put some form of highlight package on. Yeah. Um, so if and I do it 
I'll just save them to a playlist on YouTube and just make my way through it during the week mm. because then I've seen everything by the time it comes around to the next round of games and it's not a pressure. I'm a, I'm a fidget. I can't sit in front of the telly for 90 minutes or a whole weekend like Martin's just done with five games. I can't do it. I, I just fidget. I get bored. I want to do something else. So if I can sit there and watch a five, 10 minute highlight video, know everything that's happened, and, you know, even be able to take part in a discussion like this. For me, that's a much better way of doing it. Mm. If you want live games, the, as the Russian Premier League does it, they, they stream their games live on YouTube. Uh, a lot of other leagues do it. In fact, another one that's just started up this week, the Estonian League. If you want to watch some football in Estonia, then that, they're streaming their games on YouTube as well. I know it's all very um, sort of in vogue at the minute to be looking at a league you've never heard of before and then suddenly hitching yourself to a team. So if you want to do that, the Estonian that, yeah. League started this week as well. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why Charlie is part of this team. And, and, and I was thinking perhaps we could move from the Estonian leagues to the British lower leagues because there have been a number of developments. <laughs> similar um, similar um, level of temperature. One, <laughs> one perhaps for Gareth. Uh, Darren Gibson has been released by Salford City. Really? I thought you were going to say from jail. <laughs> Um, Gibson, Gibbo, wow um, Bust from the past When he signed for Everton He looked like the real deal Well, you know what, I've been watching a few Old Everton matches because they've been on TV lately And, and seeing a couple of them From around 2012 Blimey, he could pick a pass back then It wasn't just his passing ability What highlights don't show you is the fact that his defensive positioning, he was never quite out of position. And he would break up so many attacks. And then you're right, he could distribute it as well. He was invaluable to Moyes' Everton sides. Um, it's a real shame what happened to him, actually. Okay. Like a real shame. Nice guy as well. I've, I've been watching Sunderland until I die. And, yeah. Uh, Netflix, and he does come across as a, a genuinely nice guy who does care about football as well. Mm-hmm. I, I've got a soft spot for Darren Gibson. I really have. Um, there was a match, I think it was against Man City, and he scored the winner. And it was a it was a night match, so there were the floodlights were on. Goodison was bouncing, and at the end, the TV cameras panned to him. And I was actually in the ground, but it was shown on the big screen, and he was singing along to "If You Know Your History." Mm. And he'd only been at Everton for about three or four months at the time, and. And that was a real big thing because he was someone who actually was absolutely buying into the club. I mean, yeah, it helped that he scored against Man City, but he was buying into the, the values of Everton. And I think he was a bit of a crowd favourite immediately after that. And, and it's just quite a sad story, really, because, I mean, I don't know Darren Gibson, but as you say, to, you know, if he comes across as a genuine bloke, and it's one of those things where you have all the wealth, all the fame, but it doesn't necessarily give you happiness. No. Uh, hopefully he finds a new club. How old is he now? Is... 30? Oh, actually, no. Yeah, he'd be in his 30s. He still he will have something to offer to a lower league. Even uh, non-league I mean, I mean, I mean, The problem is, is given the, what the lower leagues are facing, who is going to be able to afford his wages? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's 32. He's 32. See that? 32. For a central midfielder who doesn't run that much, in theory, that should be close to the prime of his career. I'll tell you what, though. That's a fall from grace. Man United, Everton, Sunderland, Wigan, and then Salford. Only made three appearances for Salford. Was he only start, must have only signed in January. Sunderland's a bit of a cursed club, aren't they? Yeah. Like, we have to look at that. It's kind of Everton to Sunderland and then... Burn, the, the Jack Rodwell approach. Uh, Oviedo, you know. Oviedo has done okay. Oviedo, yeah, Brian Oviedo. Oviedo, baby. Um, the, the, the other story to mention with a potential Everton connection is, this is quite a weird one. Uh, oh Gareth Barry, uh, there's a dispute over the ownership of Swindon Town Football Club and it's been alleged that Gareth Barry actually owns a 50% stake in Swindon. Wow. Interesting. Why? I would, I'd say look up the full story, but essentially Swindon are going, I mean, they're likely to get promotion, but they're going through some pretty turbulent off-field stuff at the moment. And I believe that there's a football agent, Gareth Barry's agent, who claims that he was sold 
uh, that 50% of the club was sold to him, only for the owners to turn around and say, no, I actually sold it to Gareth Barry. Oh. So, that, I mean, that is interesting. That is... So, yeah, so, so one of those stories about, you know, football off the pitch being a bit of a mess. But, you know, Barry, he could probably still do a job in the Swindon midfield. Do a job in the West Brom midfield. He's still there, I think. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, I'm he's, selling off my players. He was resigned, wasn't he? Yeah. So while we're talking about non-lower league football, um, Josh wrote a blog, hopefully you all saw it, uh, about promotion. And he ended with a question, and we're going to put this question to us. The question was, are we going to protect these historic clubs that have given so much to their local communities and could give so much more in their hour of need? Or do we finally... Oh, let's ignore that. Or do we finally decide that the Premier League and its riches are all that matters and let the lower leagues die? The choice is ours. I think that's a, I think that's a question for Charlie, surely. <laughs> <laughs> Should we? Yes, we should absolutely save them. The, the answer is obvious, but yeah, and it should be. It should be for the good of the game. But you know, cynic hat on now. It, <laughs> they don't. They don't care. I mean, the FA have done a good job. I will give them that. They have released a fair chunk of money to go down to lower league clubs, to basically to the FA, the county FAs, and said, right, you know, do what you need to do. Is it enough? Probably not. As so the like the the the. the the example I made the other week of if you shared out what's remaining of the FA Cup prize money, yeah, there's there's something simple they could do. Um, divvying out what they have done again, fair. Um, I think ultimately they've made the right decision. If there's if football is unlikely, calling it now, um, and to paraphrase what the National League board said, to allow the clubs to make the best business and financial decisions they can at this point is a good thing. And that reduce their reduce their spending as much as they can um but it it becomes a problem in when is it the premier league's problem and when is it the fa's problem and i've seen this argument floated in various places that the premier league it probably has a moral obligation to help the clubs below it but does it have a contractual one no so you know should they yes will they probably not and I think that's that's always going to be the sticking point, especially when there are there's more I don't know more globalization, if you want to put it like that. Like there's more and more foreign owners coming in that do not have that that traditional link to lower league teams, and the, the, there's that that disc that sort of emotional disconnect, if that makes sense. Like they have no link to a club in League Two. So why would they bail them out? I mean, I think the thing is, if you've read Josh's article, and I was found out last week for not reading Martin's, so <laughs> I actually did my research this week. Um, Josh points out the examples that chairmen in League Two are not doing what's best for their club in terms of promotion, but they're doing what's best for the other clubs around them mm -hmm. in terms of making sure that as a collective group they can survive. So that collective spirit is definitely going on in the lower leagues. Mm -hmm. And the question is, does the Premier League, like Charlie says, actually help with that? Or do they see this as an opportunity to become a franchise league that could potentially earn them even more money than what they're earning now? Mm. It's, it's a hard one. Um, as we've said in previous weeks, there's no precedent for this. No. Like, you can't even really count the war. You know, football stops mm -hmm. for something more important, but everything was much more entwined uh, and there hadn't been... Like the Premier League is a breakaway league. Let's not forget. It was almost 30 years ago it broke away from the old Division One and became its own thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they've 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 chased the TV money on so many occasions that if the opportunity, this whole European Super League thing has been banded around for years now. Well, that's that could be the end. That could be the end game. That absolutely could be the end game here. They're the top six clubs in this country, along with Bayern and Dortmund and Barcelona and Real Madrid and Atletico and, you know, PSG. They all decide that now's the time to create yeah. the European Super I'm, League. I, I'm not sure it is just the top six. I mean, that could happen. That is a possibility. But I think the more immediate split is between the Premiership clubs and, to a lesser extent, the Championship clubs 
who have a large amount of TV money yeah. and who realistically couldn't survive, indeed like thrive, for a long time, even behind closed doors when no fans are allowed to turn up. However, if the government are saying sort of in August and September, which I think probably will be the case, that fans are not going to be allowed to turn up to games for next season, then what on earth are the lower league going to do? Because without that money from having fans go to games, they are not going to be able to afford to pay players. So there's a real, I think, urgent crisis going on between the top two divisions and the rest. Mm. Oh, exactly. Definitely. Um, but... You know, how do you how do you solve that problem? We could we could go around for weeks on it, and in fact, I dare we say probably will. Yeah, I, yeah. Probably will. I, 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 I mean, the reality is, it's not a question that we can answer at this moment in time. I wonder if, I mean, I almost wonder if clubs are going to have to lose their professional status and um, and and go semi pro. Maybe below the championship the leagues might have to, be, to become regionalised again. I mean, there's, there's so many different options, all of which might happen. Yeah, it, 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 it's just it's a really, really uncertain future ahead. You could be looking at the county system in cricket, that you've got 18 counties, the equivalent being 42, 44 uh, Championship Premier League clubs, and then everyone else is classed as minor clubs. Mm. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah. So, so, so you could do that. So, so you could have sort of like a Premier League. The Championship, in effect, becomes a Premier League Two, yeah. and then and then everyone else essentially is like is a feeder, semi-pro, um, no promotion, relegation, etc. I wouldn't mind seeing a bit more regionalisation to it because I think that would go a long way to helping with the costs. I mean, you look at National League has the North and South, which is good, but there has been talk infrequently of the National League itself being more regionalised because you end up, well, the last, well, this season you had like Barrow playing Torquay, and that's a massive undertaking. Exeter, Carlisle. Um, Exeter, Carlisle. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, where do you draw this point? And I think we're going to get to that, that that line might have to come higher. It might have to be Premier League Championship, and then you have the two strands like this which could help in so far as there's been talk for years about reserve like premier league reserve teams yeah and mm -hmm. you know i'm a big fan of three up three down from league two to non-league but the thing is again another thing you can't really even call it non the national league non-league anymore because more than half the clubs are professional full-time not county and non-league is absurd exactly. Exactly. So if you were to do Premier League Championship and then have two 24 team leagues going there and then have it kind of like how the, how the National League is at the minute where you've got the, the champions go up and then playoffs underneath it, there's another, there's the teams that are regionalised, which at League One and League Two level would save from, a from, lot of money. From what I've seen, the gulf between the top half of the National League and League Two is not high. No. And also the gulf between League Two and League One is not high. So, therefore, I mean, you know, the League One versus Conference, like, it's not as big a gap as you might think. No, but if you look at it from the last 10 years, look at how many clubs have come up from the National League and have, have either threatened immediately for promotion or gone straight up into League One. Yeah. There's, there really isn't that much. In fact, I can't think of one, in the, certainly in the last few years, that have gone up and then gone straight back down again. I know Macclesfield nearly did, but there's definite extenuating factors there. So, I mean, for the record, while well, well, we really integrate it more in regional format. While we're talking about it, regionalisation isn't a bad idea for the top tiers either. Mm. We don't look at the MLS as a gold standard of football, but the one interesting uh, aspect of that is they have their regional conferences and then they all meet for a playoffs, the best teams in that. Obviously, from an Everton point of view, if we were stuck in a Northwest group with Liverpool, Manchester City, and Manchester United, we're screwed. But if we need to talk about football clubs reducing their carbon footprint, talk about less fan travel, you're not having stupid Monday night matches at Southampton if you're a Northwest club, it actually could be an interesting idea to actually make football more 21st century. Just to pull, on your, just to pull on your MLS example, because it's not. 
strictly regionalized as in they play as far as i can remember they play everyone in their own conference home and away and then they have a, a the remaining games from the other conference it's how most american sports tend to do it they will play every almost everyone but there'll be much more of a regional focus so you'll only have say la galaxy play the red bulls maybe once a season if that Rather that, than that in itself twice a year, which again reduces costs. It's, yeah, it's still better than yeah. what we've got. So I might it might well be an interesting thing to explore. I'd be keen. To, I'd be interested to see how that looked actually. Yeah. The club that I want to bring into this discussion is Burton Albion because this week we've had the news that Nigel Clough has stepped mm. down, in effect, or for his salary to save the jobs of other people at the club because they've given the manager's job to one of the players, and. I do think that Clough's achievements at Burton really should be remembered because he took Burton from what I think was the seventh tier and with two spells over more than 20 years, Burton went from like the seventh tier to the championship, like a league where you've got former European Cup winners, clubs with parachute payments, like just enormous club compared to Burton. And for a season, he kept them up. And even when they went down, they still have been a very stable League One club. And I just look at that and say, what an unbelievable job that Nigel Clough has done. Yeah, agreed. He's, I remember he, because he left them when they were top of the National League and they were, guaranteed, yeah. they were pretty much guaranteed to go up and it was Derby he went to, wasn't it? And I can't remember who went in and replaced him, but very nearly bottled it. It was <laughs> but, no, it wasn't Hassel, no, it wasn't Hasselbank, but... Um, I yeah, got the job later, I think, when they were in League One. No, it was like a care. Yeah, it was sort of his replacement very nearly bottled it, and they only just went up by a couple of points in the end. But no, like what he's done to take them, like even into the league itself, like I'll be hands up, I'm not huge on Burton Albion's history, but to say that Burton are an established League One club, especially knowing how they've been in the last 10 years, that's impressive. Yeah. And he deserves, a, you know, you say, a huge amount of credit for that. This is exactly why we need to try and fight as hard as we can to keep the lower leagues alive. Stories like this, uh, I know they're not everyone's favourite clubs, but Fleetwood springs to mind as well. A club that have really established themselves. Forest Green Rovers, love talking about Forest Green Rovers. Um, so yeah, th these these success stories. We, 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 we lacked, Tranmere went down for a season, Notts County are currently down, they're huge clubs. But actually we should be looking to you know, promote newer clubs where possible, not MK, but other ones instead. And, and, and these clubs really offer something to the Football League. And also, there's just something wonderful about the idea that a club like Burton Albion, that, you know, wasn't even in the Conference South like 20 years yeah. ago, that even though in practice it's very unlikely that a club like that can actually go all the way. Like, if, the, if you're good enough, and you've got and you get the results on the pitch you can go as far as you want at the end of the day a couple of years ago they started it in the championship they are burton so they're quite near the top of the alphabet they were probably in the playoffs for at least one game uh and that's that's incredible like they were 45 games away from promotion to the premier league that's mad if so just to take it back to like us talking about the gulf between league two and the national league i've got the national league table in front of me here and Clubs that I certainly remember being league teams since I've started watching football. We've got Notts County, Yeovil. Mm -hmm. I'm going to technically have Halifax in there, even though they're a, a reborn club. Stockport, Hartlepool, Barnet. Who else have we got? Torquay, Aldershot, Dagenham, Chesterfield, Wrexham. Yeah, okay, there you go. That's 11. There's they're huge much, names as well. Actually they're half the huge league names. That have you know, been, that have been football league clubs in the last 20 years. When, when, I, when, I, when I was growing up, when I was growing up in, in Manchester, uh, Stockport were in a higher division than Manchester City. Stockport were in Division 1, I remember them playing. Well, they yeah, were yeah, quite yeah, high Stockport, in the championship. Uh, yeah. what's now they, the were, championship. they were a huge... They, they were there when they rebranded it, the championship, I'm sure of it. Yeah. I'm absolutely positive they were. And Man City at the time were languishing in League 1. Yeah, And then top of the National League North, you've got York City, who five years ago were in the Football League. Yeah, exactly huge names in terms of football and you look at those sides that have replaced them and you know they're doing they're doing absolutely fantastically well in the league yeah and and the thing is that there's only one promotion spot from national league so you talk about these 
I think it was 11 sides that you mentioned with this Football League pedigree, and, and only one of them is going to go up automatically, and then you've got playoffs. But, you know, it, it's a difficult league to get out of. It is, but if you do it, you tend to have the possibility to go even higher. Look at Lincoln. Oh, well, what will Tranmere got back Tranmere, to promotion? Yeah. Um, Cheltenham are doing well after being promoted, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, yeah I... Well, Cheltenham, because I know Cheltenham were one of those clubs that came from absolutely nowhere, but I thought more recently they'd gone as high as League One, and then... They were definitely in the National League quite recently. Yeah, they okay. were, they came, yeah they've been promoted in the last five yeah. years, I think. Yeah. So, it's another example of it. Yeah, no, there's, um, there, there's quite a few examples, and um, yeah, it's, um, I think that's been a pretty good chat anyway. <laughs> Regarding um, our blogs over the last seven days, I think we've discussed mine pretty extensively. Um, Charlie, do you want to give yours a plug? Because hmm. that was a good read. Yeah. yeah, well, it kind of came about a bit randomly. Um, so I will plug another thing where I appeared on the Tales of a Groundhopper podcast a couple of weeks ago now. It came out over, I think, Monday of this week. Um, and that kind of gave me the idea of... like, uh, like Groundhoppers sharing their stories a lot more. It's been happening a lot on social media during the lockdown. There's been fantasy tournaments, World Cup tournaments of literally anything that can be quantified in a tournament bracket has been done at this point. Um, but I've seen a lot of people talking about their stories in one of the forums I go on. There's very retro threads at the minute about where people went on this day in previous years. I've started even doing it on my own Instagram. Um, so I just kind of put it out there saying like, you know, I want to, you know, I want to have an you know, add to the platform of sharing stories. And this guy, SW Groundhopper, got in touch and said, yeah, okay, we can have a chat. So we did. Um, and I've loosely interacted with him before. You know, we follow each other on Twitter. So it was a good chance to sort of get to know someone else within that, that sort of, that Twitter sphere that I'm in. Um, and yeah, it was really interesting. Um, it's really good to get, a, like diff, as many different perspectives as you can because there are so many different jumping off points like you can start with okay so how did you get started and then suddenly it's okay so that's how you started you've now mentioned x y and z grounds and i've not been there hmm. so i yeah i've added five or ten to my list that i want to go to now um and leading on to how people choose what game they go to i mean for for Martin, it's obvious they're Nottingham Forest play. Um, but for Josh as well, like Josh and I talk about this all the time. Um, if there's either a ground we want to do or a team we want to do, or if there's anywhere that's kind of local to the two of us, but everyone has their own different system of doing it. And that fascinates me how people decide where they want to go and who they want to see. So it was, yeah, it was a perfect excuse to start asking these questions and, and really hear from more people. And I really want to carry on doing this. I won't do it every week because it will just get a bit repetitive if I do it every week, but maybe every other thing that I do, or maybe one in three, one in four, I want to be able to sit and actually talk to someone, really get into their mind a bit more. Yeah, and it was something that definitely added to the blog. It was really good to get um, that guy's perspective on things. And it's just generally, I think, been a really good mix of articles this week because mm. I talked about the lower leagues, you had your interview about non-league, and then, Gareth, yours was a bit more personal, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was um, looking at my life playing football. I, I was inspired a couple of weeks ago by Martin's article about his love for playing it. And it hit me that the last time I was part of a team was actually one which me and Martin were in together. About <laughs> nine years ago now. Um, yeah. And then I thought, well, why is, that, why is that the case? Because when I was younger, I was part of many different football teams. Loads of different five sides, eleven sides, seven sides. You name it. I was part of the team. Um, actually, playing quite a lot as well. And I kind of got thinking about where that all went wrong, and it kind of ended up being a little bit more negative than I wanted it to be. But behind it all was this positive message that no matter how much you're pushed down, no matter how much you're told you're not good enough, the draw of football actually always brings you back to actually just wanting to have a kickabout with your mates in the park or being part of a team every week. Anyone else hit Chumbawamba in the background? I get knocked down, I get up again. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, and we've just been talking about Burton Albion as well. I mean, they went from a team of being no-hopers to the championship. 
Gareth Hardman, the Burton Albion, if we only see him in the league. I think it's um, like it shows the importance of football that last week, as soon as Boris Johnson said, you can go and do exercise, I went with my football and just had a kick around. It wasn't even with my friends, just with my girlfriend, who is terrible at football, by the way. <laughs> well, that's two of you. <laughs> <laughs> I see you play, Josh. Let's not go there. <laughs> Um, but as soon as as soon as it was feasible to just go out with a ball, and it just made me so happy. It's crazy the impact that football can have on your life. We we are we are one player away from a five a side team. We're nowhere near each other, but that would be an um, interesting five a side team. Maybe we can get Southwest Groundhopper along. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There we go. There we go. We have got five a side team. He's not agreed to it, but he'll be in. He'll be in. Mm. No, I ended that blog by saying that when we all meet up, I'm bringing my football, and I am. I absolutely am. And um, I really can't wait for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, the other bit of news to bring you from the blog this week is that Martin Drain on the Twitter polls is over. Hey! Um, Finally! Finally. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's an absolute farce, though, how it's happened. Absolute farce. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. so on the podcast last week, we each sort of put together sort of our squad builders, sort of our um, foreign and British, um, respectively, Forest, West Brom and Everton teams. And we put it to the public and we had a competition. And my Forest team of foreign players beat Charlie's West Brom foreign team in the final by... I think I got some like eighty-three percent of the vote. Comprehensive vote. Comprehensive vote. I have to admit, I voted for Forest in the final because I thought it'd be funny, and it is quite funny that 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 team of Forest foreign players that you know we've never heard of. No, I'm joking. Of course we have. Um, I've gone all this way and taken out a for another foreign Forest eleven, then an Everton one, which you know was the best team in the tournament. Not bitter, and then I mean, uh, it, a West I mean, Brom it, it, one. It, it, it was like I I can accept oh. that that Everton foreign team was the best team in the tournament, but I hey. mean, I, I have quite a few Forest fans following me on Twitter, and yeah, they absolutely. helped me win. So you 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 rallied your troops well, and I think that we started this podcast by talking about how it's. Everton Silver Jubilee have been silver wireless. It would have been inappropriate if Everton had won it. Absolutely would, inappropriate. Would it be fair to say that Gareth's Everton team would have won if he'd indulged his soft spot and put Darren Gibson in the midfield? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think that would have made all the difference. Yeah. Fellaini, Arteta, you're gone. Gibson can run it on his own. I can't wait to see the teams we've made this week. I'm, so what? I, I'm just putting it out there. My Twitter rating will be back this week. It is as simple as that. I, I am. Uh, uh, okay, so I think that leads us nicely into this week's um, squad builder challenge. I got this from social media. I have asked everyone to design an England team, <laughs> um, but the proviso being that you cannot, that you can't have more than one player that has played for a set, the same club. So if you pick Frank Lampard. You can have no one else in your team that played for Chelsea, West Ham, or Man City. Right. So those are the rules. I also said that because I want it to be players that we know, they have to have been capped by England um, after the 1st of January 2000. So those are the rules. Does anyone want to kick us off? I, I, mean, I don't know how you want to do this. Do we want to like all name our goalkeepers? I think it's probably best if we each name our teams one at a time. So, um, okay. we can uh, uh, Martin, uh, Martin, I've been hearing a lot about your team. Why don't you tell us what it is? Okay, so I've gone for a, in essence, I guess it's a 4-4-2 slash 4-2-3-1. It's kind of asymmetrical. So I've got my right wing back kind of very high up the pitch. I've got four in midfield with my centre midfielder going out to the right and then a left winger with one up front. So it'll make more sense when uh, I put it together as kind of a formation image. But in goal, I've got David Seaman. There was no choice for me. Seaman had to be in there. Difficult choice because, of course, he's played for Arsenal and Man City, so it takes two of the major clubs in England now. But I was thinking about it. I probably wouldn't have any other players from Man City or Arsenal in there anyway in my living memory. They've had... A, a great deal of foreign players rather than British players. Um, I'll start with my kind of three at the back because I've got a right wing back. So my two centre backs are John Terry, who is my captain, by the way. I, I chose a captain. And Phil Jagielka. So a pretty solid pairing at the back. I've got my Chelsea, Arsenal and 
sorry, Villa and Nottingham Forest with Terry, Everton and Sheffield United with Jaggy Alka. Left back, I've kind of had to make a bit of a sacrifice because I'm sure we've all made some kind of sacrifices in our team. My left back is Aaron Cresswell. Aaron Cresswell. Uh, so what's, what's, that, but you've been talking all <laughs> week about how good your team is. It's got Aaron that's, that's my one sacrifice for the solid core. My 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 thing was I needed two solid centre backs, two solid centre midfielders, a really good striker, and a really good keeper. And whatever I could fit in around there, I would try and do. Mm. So Cresswell gets it. My right wing back, who is also kind of going to be bombing forward and back is Kieran Trippier. Ooh. So Tottenham, he didn't play for Man City. He started out on Man City, didn't play a single game. Yeah, okay. Um, so he doesn't clash with Seaman. Tottenham, Atletico Madrid, Kieran Trippier. My other sacrifice, my only other sacrifice was my holding midfielder, which is Lewis Cook. Um, mm. Bournemouth and Leeds. Yeah. But still, Better than Cresswell. A solid player to have in there. He's not a, not a terrible player. My central midfielder, this is where it gets good. Paul Scholes, Steven Gerrard. Gerrard sometimes pulling out to the right to support Trippier, if needs be. Attacking midfield, James Madison. Leicester and Coventry in there. Norwich as well, I think Madison started out. And then my, my two up front, or kind of left winger and centre forward, Jaden Sancho on the wing. Dortmund. He, of course, he started out at Man City as well, but didn't play. And up front, it, it, it was only one choice. It has to be Alan Shearer. Captain 2000, June 2000, it had to be Shearer. It wasn't another choice. I love, that, I love that I've only got three of the same players as you. Well, I, that my side is actually quite similar to yours. So, I mean, I'll go next. I, I made a bit of a, a sacrifice in goal. Um, I went for Jack Butland. Um, it, uh, I, I thought I'd go for someone that hasn't played for one of the big clubs. I think the biggest club he's played for is Stoke. So I'll put him in there. A right back, I, I realise I'm going to have to make a late change to this side. Oh! While we're talking I, about changes, I think Martin wants I, I, to make I, a change to his. I have to make a change? Uh, uh, okay, yeah. no, I, I, I'm going to have to come up with a change afterwards because I picked... Micah Richards at right back, and I didn't oh. realise until I heard you speak, Martin, that John Terry had also played for Aston Villa. So I've got that, tripped me, no, that tripped me up to start with as well. Um, so, so yeah, I'm going to have to make a change at right back, but I went initially for Micah Richards. Um, my centre backs are the same as yours, Martin, Terry and Jagielka. Um, at left back, I've got Ben Chilwell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Then I've got quite a technical midfield. I've got three central midfielders, um, Paul Scholes, uh, Jack Wilshere, and Delhi Alley. Okay, interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and, and then I've got a front three that I think is the same as Martin's. Um, Jaden Sancho, Stephen Gerrard behind the, um, Alan Shearer. Interesting, I, I like that. To go back to Martin's, the reason I think he's going to have to repick is you picked Jack Cork, right? Uh, Lewis Cook. Uh, Lewis Cook. Sorry, sorry, I heard you wrong. Ignore yeah, me. No, don't don't pick Chuck. Ignore Cook. me. He's, picked, he's played for twenty seven teams. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard wrong there. Sorry. That's fine. I, you panicked me. I, I checked it five times and I was like, oh my god, I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> Damn right, it. Right, um, right then, Gareth, you you prove us wrong then. If you're oh, wrong, all right, okay, we're talking about sacrifice. So my team. This is very unusual. Um, my, it's a mix of players who play currently for England and who have retired for England. Uh, my entire defence no longer play for England. One of them, only one of them actually still plays football. Wow. Uh, my strike force is a mix, but my entire midfield all currently play. So here we go. This is, this is a nice mix of youth and experience. My sacrifice has come in net. <laughs> I've gone for Pope. Okay. That's not a sacrifice. It's not too bad. It's not bad, it's not bad as a sacrifice. And you look through his list of teams, he's played for both Berries, who knew there were more than one Berry, uh, Charlton, Cambridge, Aldershot, York, and then obviously Burnley. This is a solid start, right? In defence, it's a solid 4 4 2. I've got Gary Neville at right back. Yep. Oh, interesting. Tony Adams and Gareth Southgate as my centre backs. Nice. It's uh, since 2000, no way. Yeah, Adams was part of the Euro 2000 squad, so this oh, this uh, this works. And then I've got Leighton Baines at left back. Can I uh, stop you there? Can I stop you there? 
Yeah, go on. God honest truth, and I'll try not to spoil too much of this. You and I have got exactly the same back four. Oh, yes. You and I have somehow, we've got a different goalkeeper, but you and I have picked exactly the same back four, and I'm annoyed now. Sorry, mate. I'm sorry. This is where I think we're going to differ. My midfield. So, my central midfielders are two best friends, <laughs> Declan Rice and Mason Mount. Okay. And then my wingers are Jaden Sancho. Sancho is an obvious pick. Yeah. Like, Sancho is an obvious, obvious team. pick. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> Raheem Sterling. Wow. That was my Liverpool player. I wanted someone who was not really famous for playing for Liverpool, but gone on to great things. And my front two, the best two strikers to ever play for England, Harry Kane and Alan Shearer. How has this happened that you and I have got almost the exact same team? Because you and I are the best people in this, this podcast. I mean, I'll take that. He's talking on those guys. I'll take that. I don't think there's a weak point in that team. I mean, uh, yeah. If your central midfielders aren't great, they're going to be great, though. Much, yeah. be great. I had my initial, my initial working of this team had Trent at right back and Paul Scholes in central midfield. Mm. But I wanted Sterling in there. So Trent had to be sacrificed. I think that's the main thing, really, in each of these teams we can see. Like where we started, like who we knew we had to get, and then who we've had to kind of shoehorn yeah. in at the end. I'm yeah. not going to do that hand action, but you know, <laughs> we had to. We, it was like, right, who am I going to put in here? Um, so no, that was a. Of course, I'm going to say that was a good team because most <laughs> of it was mine. Most of it was mine. <laughs> I think we know what the semi final is going to be. I'm going to I'm going to do a live draw now, actually. So Charlie, tell us your team while I. Uh... So first of all, I don't know why I thought this in hindsight, but I thought I I was going to be the clever one and be the only one to pick Sancho. Um, <laughs> that, clearly no, I thought that, too. that clearly hasn't been the case that we all think we're smarter than each other. Um, it's funny because I ended up like with a spine of a team really quickly. Like I managed to rattle off like seven players immediately, and then it was, and then I think only like three of them have survived as I've had to move things around. So. I've gone with my traditional 4-4-2 with attacking wingers, as I always do. Um, I've gone for Butland in goal as well, because I needed a decent keeper that hadn't played too high. You can tell I did the goalkeeper. <laughs> in Martin's face. Yeah. <laughs> um, Seema beats you all, I'm just saying. Well, well no, no. no. Seema, Seema was a good one, but it's the, like, the Man City thing yeah, kind of City, thing screwed it a little bit. But There were curses thrown at Seema's direction when I remembered he played for Man City. Well, but my, my back four, Baines, Southgate, Adams, and Neville. Like I wanted Tony Ad like Tony Adams was one club man. That was an easy pick. Um, same with Gary Neville. Like they're just easy picks because they're just reliable. Um, Baines and Southgate. I did I for, I kind of changed some things around and ended up taking Southgate out, put Lewis Duncan instead, because he was a like a lower one. Again, it was an easy just a plug pick. And then thought, actually, no, I can actually put Southgate back in. So Southgate went back in. Um, two central midfielders, Steven Gerrard and Trevor Sinclair. Oh, nice. two reliable midfielders that are just going to hold that down nicely and ping balls out to the wingers. The two wingers being Jaden Sancho, and I've, I don't know if he actually plays on the wing, but he does for me now. Ruben Loftus Cheek. Basically, I needed again someone. I think he counts as my Chelsea pick. Actually, didn't Trevor Sinclair play on the left for England? Yeah, he did. He might because, well have done because you've got Sinclair, who's a winger, and. Mm. Loftus Cheek that's a midfielder, so you probably oh, I can swap them around. around. Swap them. Yeah. So yeah, Sancho and Loftus Cheek on the wings, and then Shearer and Kane up front. Shearer and Kane, what a strike force! Yeah. That score you back, back falls. I think I've got a really solid team. Just like to look back because I've scribbled this in a couple of different places. My other team that I started with, I had Pickford in goal at one point. I had yeah. a back, I had a back three of Terry, Southgate, and Adams. Try getting a goal past that. <laughs> Stop. Uh, mid, what? <laughs> You mentioned Pickford. That is Martin's absolute <laughs> out of the conversation. Uh, like Pete. No, 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 that's not it. I, I think Charlie has cheated here. I'm just checking it out. What? I che I searched yeah, this as well. What Sorry, what? Loftus Cheek has played for Crystal Palace and so yeah. Southgate. Damn. Right, okay, I'm taking Southgate and put Lewis Dunk back in then. Lewis Dunk <laughs> is back in. Lewis Dunk is back in. Uh, um, you know what? If it's easy, I might use Dunk. In my team as well, in place of Vicar Richards, he can fill in at right back. Oh, I've, I've, did you not replace him? No, I, 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 I said I realised there was a clash, but I, yeah, I, I needed, yeah, you know, Duncan just going for Richards in my team as well. Big cat. 
I mean, yeah, that that's interesting. Because okay. when you said Loftus Cheek, I thought, hang on a minute, why have I got Mason Mount in this side? I could have had Loftus Cheek, and then obviously um, Martin's remembered yeah. why. Yeah, no, that's that's fair enough. Um, I will just play the I was abroad card when that clearly happened. Okay, I've, I've put together our names, and this is going to determine the Twitter poll who goes in the semi finals. Please give me yeah. Martin's team. I might win. I completely. <laughs> My team is the best. You will get absolutely annihilated. All right, give me Josh's team then, because it's England. Okay. The Forest can't buy a start. Yeah. <laughs> you can't see it, but it says Charlie. Charlie okay. is the first out of the hat, and he will believe you. Okay. He's going to pick Martin here deliberately. It is Martin. Hey! <laughs> 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 right, bring it, Hockley. Still, bring it. Gareth, you can't really see it, and then we have Josh. So if you guys send me your teams at some point in the next yeah. 24 hours, I can put some graphics there and then the, the polls will be on Twitter once this podcast goes live, probably on Friday. Yeah. I mean, if we were to pick a captain, Charlie, who would be our captain? Uh, Tony Adams. It's That's obvious, isn't it? It has to be, yeah. yeah. Josh, who was your captain? Um, He's got to look at his <laughs> um, uh, Stevie G. Oh. Right, everyone, no one vote for Josh yet. We all like uh, that's that's it. He's he's dead to us all. What's interesting though is the players that none of us picked. Like there were some decent players that didn't get in, like Ashley Cole or Michael Owen. Like I, 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 I was very in. tempted to have Trent as my Liverpool pick. Mm. I was tempted by Trent, like I said, I was tempted by Trent. Ashley Cole considered in my thoughts for a long time, um, but it removes Arsenal and Chelsea. Yeah. Uh, does it also, now this was a point that I did want to consider with Josh, but I didn't need to in the end. Both Gerard and Cole play for LA Galaxy as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, would that yeah. have knocked that out because of that? Because yeah. that was. Like, well, it's as, it's Gerard to... Peckham as well, isn't it? I was looking yeah. at Peckham at one point and then realised. Yeah, well, there is that. So were we counting foreign clubs there? Especially, I mean, I, 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 I would be tempted to count them, but it's not an issue, I don't think. It's not the other, what, the other name that I was really tempted to, but didn't want to make a specific request. I almost put Steph Houghton in there. Ah. Uh, on the argument that the ladies' sides are different to the men's sides, which would give me an extra pick elsewhere. Point. But I didn't know how well you guys would respond to that. So. I mean, I think it's an interesting point. I mean, I would have been pretty happy to see some women's players in this team. But yeah, I mean, I think it's, I'm probably glad we did keep it to men. I think we could probably do another women's thing yeah. a, a, a different week, maybe. I just wanted to be known as the work one of the group, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see who wins then. Let's see how the Twitter polls go. Quiz time. Yeah, so um, I we think... We need a jingle for this. <laughs> there you no, go. Quiz really. time. <laughs> well, <laughs> well that's something we can work on for next week. I'm now going to hand over... <laughs> this is the last Martin. week of it. Exactly. <laughs> this is the last week, Josh. There is no time. <laughs> well, again, we're, we're going to have to think of something to replace the quiz. I'm we'll sure make it revolving. We'll make it a revolving thing. Yeah. So are we going to have a different quiz master every Yeah, the Yeah, the host is also quiz master. New rule. That sounds good. I'm, I'm, I'm the host next week, so you know, we'll just... Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so for the penultimate week, it's Martin with the quiz. For the penultimate week, apparently, yeah. So today, well, this is the only week that's going to count for points. I probably won't do points next week. I'll just open it up as kind of a trivia uh, session. But this is the final round. And as I said last week, each answer is going to be worth five points. So this could completely transform things after the last four weeks. Going into this, Josh is on 49 points. Charlie is on 57 points. Gareth is on 64 points. This so is going to end. So yeah. Plenty to play for here. And like I said last week, we're going abroad. We're heading abroad. And most of these questions come from Guardian. So thanks to the Guardian for their font of knowledge of international football. Um, I think it rounds our podcast off quite nicely. It started with the Bundesliga and talking about foreign football, Estonian league coming back, South Korean league being back. I think this is a nice kind of way to come back round. So does everyone have A to D written down in some kind of format? I'll just do it. Yeah, I'm just going to... Okay, do. nice. Josh, do you have something that you can... Uh... Um, let me... I'll, I'll work on it. Hold on. I'll work on it. <laughs> nice. So some of the... There's only one question that doesn't have multiple choice here. Um... 
I think it's in the realm that plays into Charlie's hands, probably. We'll see. God, don't put pressure on me. <laughs> Let's just put it this way. I'm leading going into this, but I'm not going to win it. I'm going to get a piece of paper so I can tally our scores at Christmas Day. Charlie is Charlie's the one we're all looking at here. No pressure, Charlie. <laughs> He's known for thriving under pressure. He's not tall enough to thrive her over it. <laughs> Are you ready, Josh? Yeah, just getting, ripping some paper up. People listen to me at like, when I send a message in the afternoon, you know. I know, I know. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to start, Josh, you're going to have to yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, so question one. This, we're going to India for this question. Oh, God. Not as fast as it sounds. At least I don't think so. Okay, so the question is, at which club did Nicholas Analka, Charlie's favourite player, start his managerial journey in India? Is it A, Bengal Mumbai, B, Mumbai United, C, Mumbai City, or D, Mumbai Tigers? Do you need those answers again? Yeah, can you repeat the question? So which, <laughs> at which club did Nicholas Analka start his managerial journey in India? A, Bengal Mumbai, B, Mumbai United, C, Mumbai City, D, Mumbai Tigers. That's a Such a famous player, you'd think we'd know where he started his managerial career, but... Okay. Everyone ready? Yep. Yeah. Let's reveal. No points for anybody. What did he start? It is actually Mumbai City. Ah. ah. Good start, guys. You Indian can... Super League, how are you fair? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if the other clubs even exist. I think Mumbai India, City... India's got two Premier Leagues. It's really interesting how that's happened at the minute. That's, uh, okay, that's for another time. Fine. Okay. That's, that's for next week. <laughs> yeah, that's next week. We'll talk about the, we'll talk about the divide in India. Come back. Right, we're going to research that then. Okay. Okay, question two. In 2002, on the same day as the World Cup final, we've been speaking about the World Cup final. I feel like it's only fair to have the other final. I know this. Uh, I, know this I know the game you're on about, Vicario. It took place between the world's two lowest ranking nations. Who won the game? Was it Bhutan, Eritrea, Montserrat, or Solomon Islands? Who won that game? Charlie's now doubting himself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can you give us the options again? Yeah, so it's A, Bhutan, B, Eritrea, C, Montserrat, D, Solomon Islands. Okay. Everyone ready? Yeah. yeah. No. Okay, let's reveal. Is that a D, Josh? That's a D, yeah. It's an upside down D now. You were right the first time. Mate. Five points for Gareth and Charlie. Oh, yes. I guess based on purely on how much I like the Bhutan flag. Right, okay, Gareth, trivia for you. No points on offer, but Bhutan were the first team. Who did they beat? Oh, yeah, nice. I'll give, I'll give you a clue. Martin's already given you that answer. Uh, Solomon Islands. Uh -uh. Montserrat. It was Montserrat. Can you tell me the score, Charlie? Let's take it up another level. <laughs> Wait, I get bonus points. <laughs> no bonus points. It was 4 0. It was 4 0. It was. You see, mine was a guess. Charlie was absolutely spot on with that. So. Amazing. I feel like Charlie should get more points, but I'm being mean. So he should. He probably should. <laughs> no. Not happening. Bonus <laughs> points last week, so it's not happening. Okay, third question. This is the only one that's not multiple choice. Okay. Raul Morrison moved to Lazio in 2015. Which other English player has played for the club? Write it down. For Lazio. Probably the best. Yeah. Which other English player beyond Raval Morrison? I think this is an easy five points, isn't it? Well, now I'm doubting myself. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, I think I I'm pretty sure I know this. I'm going to look like a clown if I've got it wrong. But Right, does everyone have an answer? Yeah. Okay. Not sure of it at all. 
Shall we reveal? Yes, five points for everyone. Lovely. Nice. A little bit, little bit of trivia that's t tucked away somewhere, but somehow found its way out. That's a lovely answer. I think we're all going to need to show our internet history after this, though. <laughs> <laughs> Delete. <laughs> it's, it's very suspicious that Charlie knew the 4 0 monster at Bhutan. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's too suspicious. If anyone knows me no football? It's me. <laughs> I just told you that India has two Premier Leagues. Uh, to be fair, if you anyone knew that, know that, it would be Charlie. Yeah, would be I Charlie, wouldn't yeah. believe it of literally anyone else. I couldn't, tell you, I couldn't tell you who scored, but I can tell you. Oh, come on, Charlie. Oh, you know who scored. Come on. There is, there, is, there is... No, I don't. But there is a what film the about attendance, it. Charlie? I don't... <laughs> how many a, red there, cards? Who was the referee? <laughs> how, many, how many offsides were there? <laughs> how much money did you have riding on it? <laughs> it was 10, so hopefully not. <laughs> start young. Start on the young. That's the Birmingham way, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> Next question, please. Okay, question four. It's, a, it's another one about minnow football, so it might be geared towards Charlie. Let's see. Okay, so it's about Guam. Okay. Who did Guam win their first ever World Cup qualifier against? Is it A, India, B, Turkmenistan, C, Oman, or D, Iran? First ever international or first ever World Cup qualifier? First ever World Cup qualifier. Oh, that makes a difference. Here we go. Like, what was it? India? Turkmenistan, yeah. Iran, Iran. To be honest, if you put Scotland there, I'd probably be going for them right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Scotland thing to do. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Not okay. even in the okay. Asian qualifiers. Let's go. Josh, come on! <laughs> B, A, and D. There's one person who's got it right. Can you guess who it is? Charlie. It's Gareth. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's Turkmenistan. <laughs> the only country to have a carpet in their flag. Oh. I believe. Well, unless I'm getting them confused with one or the other. No, you are right with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A carpet in their flag? Yeah. What? Sorry, that's a useless bit of flag. It's, it's, it's why it never turns up in the flags round of a pub quiz. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, question number five. This, this one is surely for Charlie. Surely. <laughs> it's about Japan. Stop it. <laughs> Diego Forlan signed for which Japanese club in 2014? Is it A? Sorry for pr my pronunciation here. A. I to help you with this bit. Jubilo Iwata. Yeah. Okay. B. Urawa Red Diamonds. Urawa. Urawa, sorry. C. FC Tokyo. D. Cerezo Osaka. Can we have Charlie repeat those answers? <laughs> now, he was right for most of them. Jubilo Iwata, Urawa Red Diamonds, FC Tokyo, and Cerezo Osaka. Which is annoying because the team I thought it was didn't turn up in your answers there. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if I pronounce Tokyo wrong, I've... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ready for the reveal? No. Yeah, Let's... go for it. One person has it right. And this time it's the person we'd expected. Yeah, it wasn't. I've got, a, I've got a bonus question for you. I've just invented this off the top of my head. Okay. You're not getting points for it, it's just a bit trivia. Which Indian club has Forlan played for? I think I know that. Do you? Yes. Me and Josh don't, so. Go on then. The Atletico de Kolkata. I mean, he could have also played for them, let me check. <laughs> oh, wasn't the answer wrong? Or was it FC Goa? I'm just going to list off Indian Super League clubs now until I get it right. It is none of them. Damn. I'm glad it wasn't for points then. We've already had the name. I've looked it up. I won't give it. That was it Mumbai. It's yeah. Mumbai City, yeah, indeed. Anyway, Charlie gets the five points for that question. Okay, this is this is my favourite question of the whole quiz. This 
trumps everything. In what country would you find the home of FC Santa Claus? Is it A, Finland, B, Sweden, C, Norway, D, Denmark? FC Santa Claus. What a name. That is superb. Everyone ready? Let's reveal. Oh, Josh. Come on. <laughs> it is A. It is Finland. Which country is Lapland in, Josh? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Four questions to go. You've still got time to save this, Josh. Still got time. Question seven. Despite Mexico winning their 10th Gold Cup in 2015, manager Miguel Herrera was sacked two days later. Why? <laughs> Is it A, he refused a pay cut? B, he dropped the trophy and broke it? <laughs> C, he criticised the Mexico fans? Or D, he allegedly punched a TV reporter. This is like a question of sport. This is like what happens next, isn't this it? This is a question of sport. I want the clip for this. He's not as attractive as Sue Barker, is he? <laughs> Wait a minute. That's a... <laughs> <laughs> he's kept that quiet all these years. No wonder he's interested in tennis once a year. I'm glad I edit this podcast. <laughs> okay. Reveal? I can't remember the answers now. Uh, let's go with that. Oh, Charlie is back in this. Oh. He allegedly punched a TV reporter. What a guy. It's odd, it's odd that they wouldn't, that says, it threw me off that you said allegedly. Because you think of TV reporters, someone somewhere would have captured it on TV. You would think. Hmm. Maybe there is a clip. We should look that up. Yeah, anyway. There you go. He's the kind of guy, I remember at the World Cup, his kind of antics. He is the kind of guy who would hit somebody. Okay, number eight. Interesting one. You might know this. There's more of a chance of you knowing this, I think. Which country has Blackburn legend, I have put this in italics and bold, Steve Keen managed? Is it A, Thailand, B, Brunei, C, Singapore, or D, Malaysia? What a guy. Steve Keen, how did he manage in the Premier League? Badly. <laughs> Real. <laughs> A Thailand, B Brunei, C Singapore, D Malaysia. Oh, it's a total guess. Let's see your answers then. And Charlie gets the points again. Oh no! I bet he knew that. Did? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow! I thought this would be your round, Charlie. You're proving us right. You this one quits in the post. This one you might not have. No. If anyone's going to get this, I think it might be Josh. Let's see. Okay, number nine. From which French club did Leicester sign Riyad Mahrez? Is it A. Marseille, B. Montpellier, D. Gangon, or D. Le Havre? <laughs> we had two Ds there, mate. Sorry, yeah. he is Gangon. So hang on, do that again. There's A Marseille, B Montpellier. C Gangon. D Gangon. And D Le Havre. I can tell you did it French at school, can't we? <laughs> Le Havre. Le Havre. Le Havre. <laughs> Ready for the reveal? Yeah. Let's go. Oh, nice guys, everyone. Why did I think that was a difficult question? Because we you... wouldn't be able to understand your accent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Okay, last question. I'm going to make this worth 10 points because it, it might shake things up. In which Brazilian city are the club Vasco da Gama based? Is it A, Sao Paulo? B, Porto Alegre? Did I just say C? Am I drunk? No, you B, said B. You were right. Okay. C, Rio de Janeiro, or D, Brasilia? What's the name of the club again? Vasco da Gama. That did not help. 
Master Cook Watcher, isn't it? It's pretend. Like, oh, it's annoying me because I feel like Charlie knows this as well. Look at his face. I know who it isn't, if that helps. Well, one is a cl- has a club name. Isn't I it? feel like who wants to be a millionaire? I'm like, you're on 50 50 on this. Yeah, if we're on who wants to be a millionaire and we get a question about foreign football, then Charlie's the guy. Oh, the man. Okay, let's, let's see your answers. Oh, no. No points for anybody. Oh, best result possible, probably. The answer is Rio de Janeiro. Mm, okay, because obviously Sao Paulo is Sao Paulo. Porto Alegre, I think it's Gremio. Gremio, yeah. 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 That was a tough quiz, wasn't it? That was a tough round. Who plays in Brasilia? Then? Sorry, I'm curious now. I'm going to have to Google that. Charlie can take this over while I'm working out the final scores. Oh, this is close. This is really close. Brazilian. That was a good. That was a good quiz. That actually enjoyed that. That was tense. Oh, this is so close. This oh, is. God. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Just tell us. Have you found out who is um who plays in Brazil, Charlie? Le uh, do, but they are a very small uh, I say very small team they're not they're a very really recent team I should say um, they've just got like, Brasilia just has a giant national state a giant stadium because of the World Cup and the Olympics yeah I'm probably going to be missing someone incredible oh, Brazilianense play there but yeah no, it's not one of the like, none of the big Brazilian clubs play there okay Let's reveal the answer, the final scores. So, Josh, I don't think it's a surprise. You got 10 points. Finish on 59. It's a respectable effort. This was a hard quiz. I think that's better than what I would have done. I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> it's better than he would have done. He had the answers. Yeah, I had the answers. Yeah, they're very Trumpy in there. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, you do very well. Not as well as me, but... <laughs> 59. This is, this is close. Second place finished on 89 points. First place, 92 points. Ooh. So close. In this round, Gareth, you scored 25. Add that to your total of 64. Yeah, yeah. One to 89. So our winner <sighs> of the quiz is Charlie with a massive 35 points to add to his 57. Guys, what have you done? How have you let this happen? <laughs> How have you let this happen? I've said it before and I'll say it again. You're 20 quids in the post, Martin. <laughs> well played, yeah, Charlie. I mean, if you're going to have the final decisive round be about obscure foreign teams. I mean, it's obvious you wanted to win that. There's, there's one trick, though. Oh, God. In the quiz, you have to tell me who the top goal scorer in the Premier League is, starting with the letter E. Oh. Jason Ewell. <laughs> Jason Ewell, Gareth wins the quiz, that's it. Yes. <laughs> Josh said it as well. Like, yeah, enjoy yeah, it. I'll, I'll, share, I'll share my cup. I'm just okay. I'll dancing. It's not fun. <laughs> was that? I, 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 I'm very sorry, Charlie. You had celebrated, but VAR has overruled it. <laughs> <laughs> I, have overruled it. I think next week's quiz should just be asking you some of these questions to see how much I've actually... <laughs> Has some game, yeah, yeah. I mean, to be fair, Charlie deserves that because in that round, the answers that I got right usually were me completely guessing it, whereas Charlie actually knew the answers. So I will, you know, yeah. dot my bowler hat to you, Charlie. Yeah, it's just it's quite bizarre. I mean, I knew two of the answers and none of my guesses were right. Like, you think with yeah. pot luck, I would have been right a couple of times. The best thing to do, Josh, if you don't know, keep the same letter and... <laughs> We'll be only, right. write, only write down <laughs> one letter. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was fun. I, I I know we said we weren't going to do it for points next week, but we Camp- should have every now and then. We should do the, this again over a few weeks. Yeah, I agree. That was good fun. Maybe we should have another so host so I can actually have a go and show myself up to be the worst out of all of us. I can't wait. Well, to I, mean, I, well I mean, thank you for your quiz hosting duties, Martin. We look forward to next week when the quiz will be hosted by Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Any, any requests for questions? I know what we'll do. We will have 15 questions 
each of you in the next week send me one topic where you think you're quite strong. So quite a broad topic. So it could be, I don't know, the Premier League season 2015-16. Basically, we're playing mastermind. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll come up with five questions for each of your topics and everyone answers all of the questions and we'll see who does best over all of the topics. Mm, And have you got a squad builder lined up for us? Yeah, the squad builder that I want you to do, it's not going to be as tough, I don't think, as this week's, but it'll be interesting nonetheless. I want you to build a squad, not just an 11, a squad of 18 players, 11 starters, 7 substitutes, from the Premier League this season, None of your players can come from Liverpool or Manchester City, and you're only allowed one player from each of the teams. Of the other 18 teams. Oh, okay. Yeah, I like it. I I like like it. it. Yeah, okay. And tomorrow I will, if you send me across your England teams from today's pod, I will put those up on Twitter and pit our teams against each other, see who comes out on top. Yeah, okay. Well, um, that's been a really good podcast. Thank you to... Um, Gareth Hardman, Malcolm Gray and Charlie Marriott for uh, all you've done this evening. I've been Josh Hockley still. Have a great evening and we will see you for the next podcast. See you next week. Bye. Bye.